Welcome to Chapter 4, our Introduction to Cells. In this series of videos, we're going to learn about the cell, uh, the different types of cells that exist, and the features of those cells, and more importantly, why in biology we uh, look at cells as being the most fundamental unit of all structure and function of all living things. So here we go. All right, so as I just said, so we consider that cells are the fundamental units of life. They build all organisms such as we know it. They have certain components that are similar across all types of cells, and we'll take a look at those, and then we'll see where those components differ. And what you see here are um, different images of different types of cells, and hopefully we'll get a chance to do some of this in the classroom and see a few of these um, with microscopes ourselves. But the one thing that is true is that most of us, when we look at cells, we're looking at uh, organisms that are um, multicellular. But there are some organisms in which the single cell is everything. It's their whole existence, and we're going to see how they differ. One thing that we can look at when we're looking at multicellular organisms is the way in which cells are organized. So there's a hierarchy to this where we look at a single cell as being this basic unit, but that cells of a similar type that connect with each other for a particular function make up what we call tissues. And then tissues can combine, different types of tissues can combine to form things we know of as called organs. Then a group of organs that work together for a particular functions, such as um, the digestive organs, or in this case, they're showing kidneys, um, that, that would be considered an organ system. And then multiple systems that, that function all together, we say is, make up the organism. So cells, were, for a long time, were just weren't known, and that goes along with a lot of what we've talked about before. The technology that has enabled us to see cells has advanced greatly from the early days. So in the beginning, we had very simplistic um, looking ways of um, magnifying cell structures. Now we have microscopes that, such as this one on the left, which is a compound light microscope that we'll be able to use in class. And then this one on the right, which is an electron microscope, which we could only find at a university. Um, but it can, can do many different things, and both of them have served their functions. So let's move on. Two of the things that both microscopes can do, and all microscopes that we now have, is they do, there's two parameters that we look at in microscopy, and one of them is magnification, and one of them is resolving power. So these are important things to, to um, note. So magnification is just enlargement, right? So the enlarging an object. We've done this often. You use your cell phones all the time and your iPads. You enlarge an image. So we can just make it bigger so we can see um, some of the features maybe a little bit better. And here you can see the ratio here um, that we are magnifying uh, these, the, the same butterfly that we're seeing in each of these images. Resolution is the ability or resolving power is to actually distinguish um, features on that, on that object uh, that are adjacent um, as being separate. And so the higher the resolution, the better the clarity and the quality of that detail. And so you can see here, these are both an image of the same thing here. It's called a radiolarian. We, see the, we find these in the water. Um, and the resolving power on the light microscope we see right here, but then using an electron microscope, we see all this really intimate and intricate detail. So it's really cool to be able to use um, electron microscopes. We get a, a much more um, detailed view. So they, they work a little differently and they have different optical systems. So the compound light microscope is using light, hence the term light, and it has a series of lenses, um, and the, uh, we able to, we're able to magnify these images using light as it bends through different lenses to give us more magnification. 
And when we're magnifying cells, um, such as ones we'll hopefully see in the classroom, because cells basically are, are transparent, they aren't as pretty as we see them on a lot of these images, they have to be stained, they have to be treated with something that's going to help certain um, parts within the cell to pick up some of that stain and so we can see we can have some contrast and we can see um, at least some aspects of that cell that way. Electron microscopes do it a little differently because they actually use electrons, they beams of electrons to either go through this, the actual object itself or to bounce off of the objects that it, we're magnifying here. So there's two different types. Um, we can look at the transmission electron microscopes are the ones that can go through, so like transmit goes through an object and we can see a lot of fine details that exist within cells. But then there's also scanning electron microscopes. And in those, we actually can coat the surfaces of some of these things we're looking or interested in looking at and the electrons bounce off those surfaces so we can see the details that way. So it doesn't go through it, but it, we can see the surface details much better. So all of this leads us to an underlying principle in biology called cell, cell theory. And we've said it already a couple of different ways, that cells are the basic units of life. And that more than that, not just that they're the basic units, but that um, they make up all living things, but that all cells also have to come from pre-existing cells. So they don't spontaneously arrive, they have to be created, and they're created from the original blueprints of cells themselves. All cells that we're going to talk about, no matter what they are, whether they're prokaryotic or eukaryotic, are going to have four common things uh, or components. One is they're going to have a membrane that surrounds it. As you see right here, this is a, called a plasma membrane. Um, has other names too, but for simplicity right now, we're just saying this is the plasma membrane. And what that does is it, it, it separates this, the other things that cells need for um, growth and, and life from whatever that external environment is. Then it has cytoplasm. Cytoplasm made of something called cytosol. Um, and in, in this area, what we're going to find is other things that are dissolved in liquid. So this will be watery. Um, and um, um, chemical reactions happen within these watery um, environments that are uh, known as cytoplasm. There's going to be DNA. And in this case, because we're looking at a very simple picture here of a, of a cell that just has the circular form of DNA right here, so this would be a, what we call a prokaryotic cell. Um, it, but here it is. It has its DNA sort of right there. Sometimes we'll see it. It'll be loopy looking. Um, I'll show you some other pictures. And the um, other thing it has are ribosomes. And we remember we were introduced to ribosomes in the last chapter when we were looking at RNA. So ribosomes are the protein factories of the cell. And we'll talk more about those shortly. So if we are just talking about prokaryotes, in other words, things like bacteria, we're going to notice that prokaryotes do not have that internal part we call a nucleus. They have a cell wall, much like plant cells, but they have a cell wall instead that contains this, this um, particular substance called peptidoglycan. You might recognize this pept part, so it's having to do with protein and glyc. Um, has to do with sugars, so it's a it's a, a compound we'll probably not get into too, too much detail on. But peptidoglycan makes up the cell wall of prokaryotic cells, and prokaryotes are believed to be the probably the first cells that existed. That their, the origin of those were probably in in an ocean environment, and then we have. A, we can even organize those cells that we call prokaryotes into two uh, domains. And a domain is a large, large grouping of organisms. And those two domains would be the archaea and the bacteria domains. So we'll, we'll look at that too. So here is a sort of a generalized view of one 
prokaryotic cell, so they aren't quite as simple. Well, now that we're seeing a little bit more detail, we can see the chromosomal DNA, which is uh, just in a sort of a loop, loopy looking thing here. I was showing you right here. It's in an area that's called the nucleoid. Instead of a nucleus, which is actually a structure that has a, a membrane around it, a nucleoid doesn't. It's just loose in the cytoplasm, but it's the location inside the cell where you find that DNA. We have ribosomes, which are those little dots that you see in the interior there. Um, we have the cell membrane, which if you remember that plasma membrane, but it's also in this case surrounded by a wall, much like plants, that wall which would have peptidoglycan. And um, there are other structures that are possible um, in some other types of bacterial cells. The other thing that's different about prokaryotic cells than eukaryotic cells is their size. So there's a tremendous difference in size. And size in terms of cells is, is a really important um, consideration because small size is going to facilitate materials passing into the, the, the cell and out of the cell via that, that membrane that's surrounding it. So the smaller size allows a greater surface area as compared to the volume or the space it would take up. So the surface area to volume ratio is much better in these very small cells. And that helps for, especially in prokaryotic cells, it helps for things to move in and out of the cell that it needs. Um, in eukaryotes, we're going to see a little bit different. We have some structures and some things that can help to move things in and out. So here's a great picture, really. This is classic picture you see in most biology books where it kind of explains this idea of surface area to volume ratio. So if we're looking here at A, you see the surface area, we have a, a, the side is, is a value of one. And then we have a, a surface area then, if we were to calculate surface area, would be six. Um, and its volume, right, which would be the length times width times height, or the, the, the sides, right, would be one. So the surface area to volume ratio is considered, uh, would be the number six. Surface area, six, to the volume, one. But now start getting bigger. So let's say that this thing that here, now that we see a combination of these, are, is, we could say this is instead a single cell, then we'd see that the sides are worth two, uh, which means that the surface is going to be um, 24, and the volume would be 8. So when we're comparing the surface of 24 to the volume 8, we're looking at that ratio of surface area to volume, then our number decreases, that's 3. Go bigger and you can see what that does in terms of calculating. So what is more ideal, especially for the, so the prokaryotic cells, but really all cells, is to have a high surface area to volume ratio, so the smaller size is better. This is just a different way of looking at it. Again, basically you can kind of see here that now they're putting in a, a nucleus inside here. So now we have a less a distance between the inside of the cell and the outside of the cell to move things either in or out. And we are going to take up uh, this next topic. We're going to look at eukaryotic cells in the next video. So I'll stop here, and then we'll re um, go through. Uh, this will be a series probably of three videos to walk us through the basics of cells and cell structure. So that's it.